you should have access to healthcare no matter what. Uh, it's maybe a different type of a healthcare, right? It may be uh, triage, uh, but on the same time, the whole fact that sometimes you cannot access or afford, that's unacceptable. And I think we do have a lot of a technology that's coming into play that can make this more scalable, uh, easy to do. And uh, we're already doing it in, on many different markets. But the question is, why not healthcare? It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless with the fires that burn within us. But I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. Dr. Salad is the Medical Director of Digital Health at Yale New Haven Health, a multi-hospital system that has more than 2,600 beds and 26,000 employees. For years, Dr. Salat has, bit, has built a reputation as a digital health innovator, and today he provides a unique link between the clinical and the technical worlds of health tech. He's been on the front lines exploring the uses of things like blockchain and augmented reality, but he also understands the practical needs of a big university-based hospital system. So I'm excited to get his wisdom on all of that and more today. So Dr. Salad, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for reminding so I want to start with a bit of background about you. I want to get to know you a little bit. You got your initial medical degree in Belarus, then came to the United States for your residency and your postdoc work. Uh, we talk all the time at Startup Health about the importance, the essential nature of a global perspective on achieving health moonshots, on global collaboration. Uh, what did you learn about global health by moving between these two worlds and gaining that macro global perspective? Thanks, Logan. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, having been trained uh, in a world where healthcare is universal to a certain degree, and your biggest problem is actually access and waiting for care, not necessarily paying for that, um, actually completely unprepared me for American reality. And uh, kind of moving mo more in United States way where on top of actually same access problem and a similar problem with finding a clinician and ability to find um, the provider who will take your insurance, you also start to deal with things that you actually never heard of, uh, which is your medical debt, medical bankruptcy uh, and related things. And this kind of made it realize that um, to a certain degree, we uh, spoiled, right, uh, in some of the uh, less wealthy nations where you do have um, uh, access to the healthcare and you start to understand it as a universal human rights, uh, even though it doesn't really perceive the same way um, everywhere around the world. Um, and it's, it's interesting by being here in the United States, right, and seeing uh, the big movement around the social determinants of health uh, and uh, accessibility uh, to the healthcare, that we are slowly starting to move in that direction. Um, and of course, we have to find a balance uh, because unfortunately, no one benefiting from the access to the poor healthcare or having to healthcare uh, by the time you do not really need the healthcare. Uh, but at the same time, uh, when most of the people are too afraid of seeking care because that can um, impact them uh, potentially drastically forever, uh, it's, it's not a good state. Um, and kind of getting away from some of the doom and gloom uh, from the pure business perspective, the way you actually look on the healthcare is completely different. Because uh, when, when you move between the countries and between the continents, uh, you, you realize that your customers uh, from your products are very different. Because back, uh, back in, uh, in Eastern Europe in uh, socialized medicine, the whole idea that you will be selling something to clinician is pretty much nonsense because nobody has money, nobody is willing to pay you anything. Um, and you mostly focus on the care delivery uh, on the patients who are willing to get access to the vetted and the higher quality specialists. Um, and then you move to United States and you realize that, wow, the market is completely different. 
right? And here, physician and healthcare groups do have a lot enough disposable income to potentially pay for your additional tools, to work on your efficiency, uh, to work on things that allow them to practice better, faster, safer. Uh, and in this case, um, you realize that your market is way bigger um, than you initially thought. So, Interesting. Uh, what I'm hearing is that this sort of global perspective really informed and inspired your journey in health innovation. I mean, really gave you the perspective you needed to think about access and cost in new ways. Yes. Yeah, so I do believe that uh, access to healthcare, right, uh, is universal human right. Um, so you should have access to healthcare no matter what. Uh, it may be a different type of a healthcare, right? It may be uh, triaged. Uh, but at the same time, the whole fact that sometimes you cannot access or afford, that's unacceptable. And I think we do have a lot of a technology that's coming into play that can make this more scalable, uh, easy to do. And uh, we're already doing it in, on many different markets. So the question is, why not healthcare, right? Like why, why in healthcare, um, we still perceive that things need to be done manually. And full disclosure, when I started practice, everything was still on paper. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm not that old, to be honest. And it's just amazing that we, you know, starting and we're talking about all the digital transformation now in a technology. And I think it's a combination uh, of uh, bigger tech players kind of getting and scaring some of the healthcare providers. But in essence, uh, it's important to realize why we're even looking at that. Right. And, and here is not to, uh, create better margins uh, potential in the healthcare, right? By automating and spreading clinician beyond their capability, but hopefully to actually provide more patients with more affordable care. When it comes to health innovation, you've been involved in a range of initiatives. Uh, you've led initiatives around blockchain for health. I mentioned at the beginning that you've piloted the use of Google Glass in emergency response. So I'm curious, in terms of the health innovation landscape, kind of what is your focus today? You might have a range, so you might have a list, but what is your big uh, health innovation focus today? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough question uh, because to a certain degree, we are working on um, a lot of different projects. Uh, a lot of them, you, you can broadly uh, put them in the categories of uh, data integration, right? Um, so things related to the interoperability, the way you extract information, the way you share information, the way you produce information from non-structure to the structures like NLP, NOU, um, and uh, the way you actually interact uh, with the information as both clinician and a patient, which may be including your voice interfaces, right? As a continuation of Google Glass, your Amazon, your, um, your Google Home uh, devices, uh, and then ambient intelligence that's actually helping clinician to practice while they're in the hospital. And then there is a one big thing that's been a part of our healthcare for a while, and we just continue to refine related to the clinical decision support. Uh, which can be in a form of, of tools, right? Like best practice alerts or some uh, clinical practice guideline that's embedded in your electronic medical records uh, and the next generation of thing that's coming, right? Something that's been powered by uh, FHIR, fast healthcare interoperability uh, uh, or uh, CDS hooks. Uh, so something that's allow you to bring your knowledge uh, across the healthcare system, right? Across the borders um, and, and, and frankly, uh, to, to bring it closer uh, to patients and providers. You mentioned a few themes there. You mentioned data integration, uh, ambient intelligence, clinical decision support. Um, has any of, of those, any, have any of those themes changed uh, over the course of the last year through the pandemic? Has your core focus changed? Or, I mean, those are pretty uh, evergreen uh, areas of health innovation to be working on. So how has your focus changed due to the mm -hmm. pandemic? So, um, during the pandemic, everything, uh, telemedicine, everything related to telemedicine exploded. So at some point we were doing more than uh, 60,000 telemedicine visits a day, which was a pretty okay. significant uh, for us. Um, so, and if, if you think about it, uh, when your workforce, especially your clinical workforce start to move away from the wall garden environment that you designed to you in a hospital, 
right? Uh, a lot of the like safety nets related to the clinical decision support start to disappear, right? Because your nurse may not be next to you, sitting next to you, telling you, doctor, you forgot to order this. Uh, or at this point, right, you may be practicing on a smaller screens with like a different environment. So from, from that perspective, um, a lot of the clinical decision support uh, became even more important. Uh, and uh, what most importantly, the data integration uh, became absolutely critical. Because in this case, uh, when, when you start to introduce programs like hospital at home or programs related to remote patient monitoring, uh, the amount of data is just overwhelming. As a clinician, you cannot just go and review your blood glucose reading for the last two weeks, right? If you do it on a continuous glucose monitor, uh, it, you need tools. Uh, you need tools to better visualize it, right? You need tools to uh, hopefully automatically assess it. Um, so that's where we had a lot of a focus um, at Yale and frankly at Node Health, um, where how you can ensure, right, that's out of the hundreds and hundreds of vendors that's perceived to do the same things. Um, you actually take the one that's been validated and actually in reality doing whatever they're claiming to do. So. Well, I want to get into uh, all of that, how you assess vendors. That'll be an important part of our conversation. Uh, really quick, you mentioned Node Health. It's worth having you explain briefly what that is. So uh, Node Health, uh, it's a network of digital evidence. Uh, right now is um, it's a non-for-profit that we have more than 20 uh, healthcare uh, members. And our goal is to get together between healthcare providers, insurers, um, pharma and developers, uh, and A, develop uh, validated um, pathways, right? To, to look uh, and evaluate uh, digital health intervention. Um, two, to actually discuss what worked why did not? How do you design uh, studies? How do you ensure that you're actually proving uh, and demonstrating and an effect of your application? Um, and the three is to actually spread uh, the knowledge uh, and, and learn. We, we actually launched our uh, digital medicine university uh, during our last conference in December, which was very well received. Um, it's one of the first digital uh, medicine certification courses. And the goal is to actually um, help uh, local leadership in the healthcare systems or a smaller institution to start building this, um, this knowledge around the new trends in the digital health and, and the way you can look at that. Um, uh, you touched on this a minute ago, but I want to get into it a little bit more. You said you got to the point where you, you were doing 60,000 telemedicine visits a day. Uh, and I want to know uh, what your really what your greatest learning was from that experience. What did you take away? How did you change the way that you wanted to do telemedicine uh, because of the volume that you saw? Uh, how did you tweak the system um, in a way that you, you never could have had you not really seen that kind of volume? So um, first of all, I'm extremely grateful that we started to prepare for telemedicine expansion years ago. Uh, I don't think any of that would have been possible uh, without a lot of work before the COVID. Uh, because from our perspective, uh, yes, it was challenging to scale, but we at least knew what we're doing, right? And um, I would say what, one of the biggest lessons of COVID is uh, you shouldn't be afraid to uh, do a bold, uh, bold decision and push based on your vision. Because uh, in uh, Yelling Haven Health, uh, we talk a lot about the telemedicine uh, RPM, but then about four years ago, uh, leadership just made a commitment that, yeah, that's, that's the direction we're going, right? Like we, we have a budget, we, we just need to do it no matter what. Uh, and of course, uh, it's required resources and time, but that's kind of what made us prepared for COVID, then you don't really know when COVID will strike. Um, so for, for a lot of that, uh, when you do have a infrastructure, when you do have people who already know um, how you can scale it and what you can do, it's make it definitely easy. Uh, the second thing is uh, the partnership between your public and private is critical because no matter how well you're positioned from your internal FTE, 
if you pick up the vendor that cannot scale with you because technologically they just cannot scale. Unfortunately, that's maybe a dead end for you. Uh, and unfortunately for some of a smaller startup that's actually um, kind of going against the disadvantage because especially on mission critical elements, uh, the willingness to pay for your smaller product, right? As a, as a key component, it's going down um, because of the related risks. But at the same time, if you actually can deliver, you can grow quite fast. So it's a, it's a blessing and a, and a curse. Um, and, and lastly, um, we realized how unrational all the fears were related to telemedicine. Uh, because for years, uh, clinicians were telling that, no, we need a lot of a training, hands holding, and it's being postponed for the go live because we need more trainings, even more education. And then one day, everybody went live, just like that, right? And within a week, people were still complaining, right? Someone didn't, was unable to launch something, but most providers were able to find their way around, self-trained, and we just moved on. Uh, so I think to a certain degree, that's the way it's happened with electronic medical records in US, uh, because we've been talking about it for years and then it's just happened. Um, and it's happened again with telemedicine. So I think that's a pattern. Unfortunately, in the healthcare, we like to talk, we like to over-engineer and over-prepare, and we just need to rip the bandage, right? Say that's how it's going to be and just move forward. Gotcha. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and get practical and specific about how Yale New Haven uh, works with startups. Obviously, we've got a, a bunch of uh, entrepreneurs and founders on this call. Uh, oftentimes, a, a key to success is finding that, um, that perfect hospital partner, system partner, university partner to really um, try something new out, you know? And so I, you mentioned earlier that you assess vendors, you got to figure out really who's going to deliver and what you need. So big picture, how does Yale New Haven think about partnering with startups? Again, um, a lot of the time, it's actually depend on the startups, right? How old are you? What's your funding rate? And what's you're looking from the partnership? Um, because depending on your partnership um, agreements, we, we may offer you a different help, right? Or we may look at you differently. And, and here is why. The, the easiest thing to understand is when you're a relatively mature startup, right? You're coming with us as a, not the first place. Uh, you already have your case studies ready, right? So we can actually go talk with the customers. We know what you're doing. You have a sum of the track records. Um, it may not be you know, extensive, but you have something, right, to go through. And uh, it's also coming with a maturity state on both your technical and the support team. So here's what it means. Like when our security team starting asking clinical design questions right around your platform, you actually can answer the questions and not just bring an engineer in our call that's mumbles, right? And just say everything. You, you need to be very specific around that. Uh, you, you can do this in a timely fashion. You can do it professionally because unfortunately, if our security team has any doubts, it's not happening, right? Only because the buy-in uh, for pretty much any startup is relatively low. Um, so it's more like exploratory. So if there is any barrier uh, for adoption, it's pretty much the project is non-starter. It's not going forward. Um, and then just realize that the whole fact that the healthcare system saying yes, right, to you as a mm, uh, medium-sized project doesn't really mean anything, right? It just means that at this point, stakeholders align enough uh, to allow your project to proceed. Uh, doesn't really mean that healthcare system even actually do the pilot with you because uh, the things may move so slow that by the time you actually will be close enough to pilot it, the interest will be zero uh, because your clinical champions moved on, right? Or something else. So why it's important because uh, even though you may have some project managers from the healthcare system, you need to manage your own projects, period. Mm. There is no way around it, right? If, if the healthcare system do not provide you with a playbook, provide them with a playbook. Provide them with a timeline, work with a timeline. And even if the healthcare system hesitant to tell you, oh, we cannot commit or something, just make them accountable to at least some of the timelines. Because unfortunately for 99% of the smaller startups, the, just the desire to work and push 
from the local technology is just not there. Uh, the, the question is how you can make it more attractive, right? And uh, again, it's, uh, it depends. Um, clearly, if you are generating value together, so you co-invent, right? You're, you're working with a healthcare system and healthcare system actually help you to redefine and design your product. Um, that may help. Um, the problem with that, again, uh, you may be giving some equity and giving some equity, you're not sure what you may get back, right? Because in this case, the whole fact that you expect the healthcare system to give, it's not necessarily that will be exactly what you're getting. So from that perspective, every time you design an agreement, just ensure that you insert very clear uh, KPIs uh, into the progress uh, and you, you know, monitor it on every step. Uh, going back um, on, uh, on the startups, at least what do we expect from them? Um, we actually, for external startup, we work with a very small number of uh, early stage startups. Um, so I, I think just look from the partnership perspective, uh, PR news or and everything, uh, what's kind of a startup healthcare uh, system worked with. And if you're not on the same stage, just don't waste your time. Uh, because even though you may be invited and have multiple discussion, it's very possible you may be wasting your time because the team will not be even able uh, to bring you in. Um, and, and when you're there, just come with your playbook and scenario, right? I already touched about uh, this, but be very upfront what you're looking and why you're looking to do that, right? Because there is a huge difference between you selling a product uh, and you co-developing the product. And unfortunately, a lot of the startups are not there mentally, right? Like we get a meeting and on the meeting, it's very unclear to me what they're trying to pitch me to sell me something, right? Versus they're looking for the data or I, when you have this 30 minutes, 40 minutes in the initial meeting, that's your time to make an impression, uh, make it count, right? I, when I'm walking out of the room, I need to know what you're doing, how you're doing, why I should help you, right? And what's kind of the benefits for both of us. I want to dig a little deeper into this idea of creating value. And you mentioned a couple of times uh, co-development versus selling a product. Uh, you know, a big issue in, in healthcare collaboration is aligning incentives, uh, figuring out what the big drivers are for your potential partner and how they align with yours. So what are the big drivers for Yale New Haven? We talk about lowering utilization, lowering cost, opening access, improving the patient experience. You know, what, and then you just mentioned co-development and kind of all that goes with that. What are the incentives that really are meaningful to your system? All of that. Uh, and <laughs> uh, unfortunately, that will be the answer, Logan, to uh, pretty much all of the important questions from almost every healthcare system, right? Because if you'll find me one executive who will say access is not important to them, right? Or uh, things related to the quality uh, of healthcare delivery is not important, that will be a total lie. Uh, the, the question is where you may have current priority or where your team is mature enough to potentially innovate together with a vendor who may have no idea how things are done. It's a different question, right? So sometime, um, we may have a strategic priority to make it happen, but because it's just take too much efforts for us to go and work with outside vendors, we may just build it internally, right? Hire internal developers or external uh, partners, but purely on developing fund and just go solve the problem. Uh, so from that perspective, um, when the startups coming, not with a technology solution, uh, searching for a problem, right? but with a clear problem, especially if it's been validated, right? You're bringing me your CMS data or you're bringing me something related to our performance and you're telling me, okay, based on this information, I found an open sources or maybe uh, on the claims data, I can do A, B, C, D, right? Which will provide you this kind of a ROI. Uh, it's a very different talk, right? And frankly, that's how a lot of the more mature startups approaching it. This is just a side follow-up to that. Uh, what's the best way to understand those pain points? You said if someone comes in, they understand your problems already before they've even had the discussion. Uh, how do they gather that, that knowledge? Uh, you talk, unfortunately, right? There is no substitution. There is no 
uh, easy way to find it. And you, you have to talk with uh, your executive, right? I mean, C-level or frankly, with the practicing providers. Uh, the problem with a lot of the time, what you get, you get like one person uh, vision, right? So uh, if you are not diverse enough uh, in your interviews, you actually can get like one of a silo. Um, and, and we see that a lot, right? Like for example, the good example is communication tools. Uh, you go to the healthcare network or the patch of the network where secure chat may not be implemented, right? Or something else is happening and you start talking with providers and all of them say, we need a secure chat, right? And based on that, you may create a false assumption that's creating a secure chat is a good idea in 2021. And unfortunately it's not, uh, right? So I, I, I think like you kind of, you have to be careful with this like interview silos, but otherwise uh, you go outside, you talk with people, you show them prototypes, right? You, you're co Um Dr. Salad, I want to talk about what a successful partnership looks like. You kind of gave some of the red flags. You kind of said, uh, talked about how difficult it can be to uh, make that partnership work in terms of uh, being the right product at the right moment on the time on the timeline that works for the university. But I wonder if you could give us a, a case example of a successful startup partnership uh, with Yale New Haven. What worked and why did it work? So, when you look on the success, right? Uh, it's it, it's all frankly about win win for both of us as a healthcare system and organization because you're you're talking about the value. And uh, from, from the value perspective, uh, most of the time, at least you know, 90% of all our um, startups we work with, um, we committed significantly more resources and time that we initially you know, anticipated, discussed. And a lot of the use cases started um, to grow, right? So I, I think the, this traction, when you start to develop the trusted partnership with your, uh, with your partners, with your vendors, when it's, it's way beyond original use case, right? When you find the benefits of their team and their technology and start to create and bring more and more use cases and more complex use cases, that's something that we're looking for, right? And, and think about it this way. Uh, for from the Yale New Haven Health perspective, the best partner, the partner that currently have a very formed team, very good enough, right, form enough product, so we can start working on that. But then we can uh, validate it, right, or co-validate it together, and then starting develop it, right, and bringing it further. Something that's allow us to kind of scale our expertise beyond our doors, uh, and something that's kind of bringing value beyond just like internal product consumption, right? That's that's whole co-investing and co-development part. Are there any specific cases that you can point to that are public knowledge, uh, just successful partnerships with us, with startups? Uh, not something that's public, public knowledge, right? Because we do have uh, companies, first of all, most of this is like two, three years old, right? Uh, and, and we do work with, uh, with several companies. Uh, I, because I don't really know what's part of this close is not, I'll just stay away from, uh, from sure, a great area. Sure, no worries. I, one of the themes you talked about at the top of the uh, hour was just interoperability and data integration. How this is like a big theme for you right now. And I wonder, you know, with the new, you know, fire standards, et cetera, like what do you see as the next frontier for integration uh, in health? So uh, it's 2020, so fire is not you anymore. Uh, so we, we should just all start using it. And now with uh, UCDI version one, widely available, uh, there is absolutely no reason actually legally prohibited, right? <laughs> not to have this uh, on a healthcare system and, and uh, insurer level. So I think from that perspective, that's actually opening a completely new world of use cases that was almost impossible to do before, right? Like like, but when you think about it now with a sheer permission from the patient, you suddenly can get access to pretty much everything, right? Something that's required you a while ago to get one-to-one -one agreements with all the healthcare system. And, and, and that's a completely different way to think about all of that. 
Um, and, and then on top of this, you are adding mandatory reporting of your costs, right? So out of a sudden, you actually not only know what kind of a health being provided in the healthcare institutions, right? You actually know what and how to charge for that, right? And, and your care and the costs means you can start calculating values, right? You can start calculating use cases related uh, to value-driven care where it can be from perspective of any of your uh, stakeholders, right? Insurers or most likely from the patient where you help them not only to get good care, right? But decide uh, where can you get this care. You've obviously given some thought to the impact of this open patient data. Um, what do you feel like are some of the most uh, positive things that a health system can do with that new level of open patient data, some specific use cases? So first of all, stop resisting it, right? It's coming, it's, it's here to stay, just stop. Because uh, at this point, there are still a lot of uh, healthcare system that would rather take a penalty than open up an API. Uh, that's uh, unacceptable. Uh, and that's, that's will not stand for long. Right, so I think at this point from healthcare system, you just have to embrace it uh, and uh, ask yourself a question, why are you resisting, right? Uh, and if your answer is I'm resisting because I'm afraid of A, B, C, D, uh, then you have to have a long discussion with your clinical teams, with your quality teams, that you shouldn't be afraid of that, right? Uh, one of the things uh, is we like to patronize patients and say, Oh, I, you know, patients will never understand that and patient cannot have access to that. It's, it's wrong. Uh, first of all, yes, patient may have questions, but it's their right to ask questions. Uh, you may design a smarter system. Uh, so that's helped them to better understand, right? Uh, frankly, at this point, if you truly use a lot of a convoluted languages in your notes, uh, you either should stop doing it, which is better, uh, or you can use additional tools to actually translate it right to your patients and as um, you know uh, as a knowledge reference. Uh, but most importantly, uh, in an expensive healthcare system like United States, uh, this care and information it's it's a product, right? Uh, so you you anticipate that you have access to the full version of a product you're actually paying for. So from that perspective. Uh, there is absolutely no meaningful reasoning why you should stop uh, doing any of that. Um, I'm, I'm thinking again about the beginning of our call talking about you trying out Google Glass while doing an emergency response uh, at a drill out at the airport, explosions, uh, you know, um, and you were really trying to see like, where is this technology going to go next? And I wonder if you use your crystal ball and that experience and you look into the future, uh, whether it's augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, uh, use of the blockchain, what gets you really excited about some of the technology that's around the corner? We're not quite there yet, but you think we're going to be there within the next 10 years. So frankly, it's less about technology, more on the use cases. Um, and uh, pretty much all of that are on a different level of maturity. Uh, so for example, going back to the blockchain, right? We, we're going through this hype cycle and unfortunately it's getting harder to do anything in the blockchain during the hype cycle. Uh, so we are on yet another peak. Um, so at this point, there is too many uh, projects that focus purely on the financial rewards on the blockchain and tokenization around that. So I, from, from all of the technology, the, the things I'm looking at is in a fundamental problem you're solving and why your approach to technology is better, right? So if you look on, on augmented reality, um, the question is why do you need this additional context information, right? While you're interacting with a patient and augmented reality, uh, when, we, when we work with a Google Glass was just a way to bring information closer to you as a, as a physician. Um, it was not necessarily a bet on a specific device or a vendor. Um, it was a bet mostly on desire of clinician to interact with a system by voice, uh, aka Jarvis style from uh, Avengers, right? Uh, and uh, getting some of the contextual information when you truly need it. Because spending time searching EHR, 
uh, is just time consuming, right? And knowing how to search for that. And um, a lot of these things are coming in fruition, right? We have a lot of the voice assistants right now at home. We testing several use cases related to the voice related um, assistance in the healthcare and things are moving in that direction. They're not moving as fast as I would love it to move, right? But then historically, I look how fast things uh, progressed uh, before that, and we're actually moving in incredibly fast. That brings us to the top of the hour. Uh, Dr. Salad, I uh, speak for everybody when I say thank you for taking the time to open up about your work, about uh, Yale New Haven, and the direction you're taking. I'm excited to know that you're there and you've got this uh, focus on uh, access to care, not just the bottom line and the ROI of the startups that come uh, and talk to you, but really how can we open up this uh, high level of care to the most people uh, possible. So um, really happy to hear that from you and happy to get your wisdom today. So I appreciate you taking the time.